Hello and welcome to the IDC European Futurescape 2020 webcast. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Thomas Meyer and I'm the general manager for IDC's European Research Unit. And I'm joined here today by Phil Carter, the chief analyst for IDC in Europe. Thank you, Tom, uh, and a very warm welcome from my side. I'm looking forward to a very entertaining session full of new insights, new stories, and maybe a Christmas carol or two, Tom. Well, if you have time at the end, maybe we can swing to that one. I always enjoy singing with you, as you know. So thank you very much for all being here and joining us today. And a thank you goes to the community who we've been working with throughout the year, the startups, the vendor executives, as well as our end user community, the CIOs, the CTOs, digital executives executives and obviously the IDC analysts. So thank you very much for helping us shape both the year but also the years going forward. And it's been quite a lot of work, I think, overall. But before we go there, join us. Join the conversation with us. The hashtag is IDC Futurescape. Give us your opinions. Send us your questions through. You also have the console. You can send questions through as well. And we'll get back to you if you don't have the chance to do this during this webcast. So wonderful. A lot of work has gone into this. We've pulled a lot of the community. We've also worked with the IDC community. It has been a labor of love, Tom. Uh, a lot of work that's gone in, uh, 13 squads working from Moscow to Lisbon, uh, 60 analysts, 15 support team members working in six streams, objective to create fact-based, bold, but hopefully relevant predictions that we think are gonna shape the market in 2020. And this year, we have a bonus. We have the Futurescope PIN code for success in 2020, five key numbers, uh, key data points that we think all of the audience should take away uh, to help drive their thinking and planning for 2020. And we'll get back to that later. Now, we have an exciting session planned, but before we get into the future, let's take a little bit of a look at how we did last year in terms of our predictions. Uh, well, so look at this, Tom. Um, I would say a, a bit of room for improvement uh, in terms of how we did last year. A few too many yellows on this chart for my liking, mainly due to timing issues, not so much if, uh, but when these things will happen. A uh, good example is blockchain. We thought uh, blockchain would start to move out of financial services into supply chain and manufacturing uh, type of areas. That's not happening as fast as we expected. Same with cloud as a foundation for architectures of the future. We think that that's going to really kick off in 2020 as opposed to 2019. And the one that re we really under, uh, we, that we really didn't focus on so much was the IT skills piece, and we undercalled that. Uh, we thought that was going to hit 90, 90 billion in terms of lost revenue uh, opportunities by 2020. It's actually a lot higher than that, Tom, mm -hmm. and we're going to come back to that during the course of the discussion. Yeah, because I think we all feel that the people uh, issue is particularly a one that we need to deal with. Okay, thank you very much, Phil. So now I talked about the community. We did poll a number of them and we got some feeling about how they feel about how things are going now in the future. Yeah, so moving forward, Tom, this is the 2020 view. What do we expect uh, as we head in towards the next 12 months? And this is fresh data, directly out of the field. Last night, we pulled this data uh, from uh, our C-suite executives, our Futurescape poll. And as you can see here, the number one thing that they're really focusing on in terms of the impact of their businesses moving forward is the economic slowdown. Um, and that's reflected in terms of uh, the economists' um, forecast for, for next year, so the trading economics forecast that we're going to hit 1.4% in terms of GDP growth in 2020. So that's a half of where we were two years ago. Um, and it is a time for financial discipline. Now, coming back to the PIN code, Tom, that 1.4% is the first number for that five-digit PIN, co PIN code that we're going to come back to throughout the course of the So discussion. people need to remember that. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So there's this mounting pressure that's building at, at, at the moment already, but we've already seen elements of that in 2019. Yeah, so if you look at um, how things are uh, happening across the leadership uh, area, across the, the, the market in 2019, 
unprecedented number of changes at the CEO leadership level across both vendor and also uh, the tech buyer community. So we saw in, in, for example, the FTSE 100, 18 CEOs that are either departing or planning to depart this year. Um, so it's nearly one in five CEOs. The average tenure of the CEO has gone from eight years to five years um, across the, the top 500 European companies uh, at the moment. So that pressure is really starting to mount. Okay. So can you give us a bit more context? What do we have to look forward to in 2020? What's the expectation? Well, in addition to the, those concerns around the macroeconomic environment, what's clearly shining through is that digital transformation and the, the need to execute on digital transformation is really building up at that CEO level. Last year, we highlighted that 65% of CEOs were under pressure to execute on this successful digital transformation. Um, that's shot up to 80%. So this is adding to the stress to that, that senior leadership uh, uh, team across the board. Because the, what they have to manage, it's a tough to uh, job here, Tom, is they have to manage this transition to the future enterprise, which is uh, an organization where tech is everywhere, it's platform enabled, ecosystem centric, and innovation is, is business as usual. Now, last year, Tom, if you remember, what we introduced was the, the blueprint, the digital blueprint for multiplied innovation to help organizations start to get to that endpoint of the future enterprise. And I would mirror that as well. So whenever I've used the digital blueprint, it's been very well received. And I think a lot of people could mirror that they were on this journey and identify with those uh, five pillars. Now, there needs to be a focus, though, that's different that we feel needs to uh, now be deployed. Yeah, so the next phase of that blueprint, Tom, is the digital impact framework. So we're launching that today for the first time. Uh, and the key difference is that this is going to focus on outcomes uh, from digital investment. So the focus is on outcomes, 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 and the need to deliver that impact. It's a much more dynamic flow of uh, these five pillars, whereby the organization needs to redefine value that it delivers to multiple elements of the ecosystem, but to develop a strategy that aligns the entire organization to change that business model, which is underpinned by technology, but powered by the people. Now, what we're going to do is create and align all the predictions uh, to that framework. So you, throughout the session, we're going to try and align those to, to that framework. And what we want to do here is really bring IDC's mission statement to life. Um, and I'm going to read this just to make sure I get it right. Uh, so the IDC's mission statement is that we want to change how the world thinks about the impact of technology on business and society. So we are going through this transformation as well. We want to support our customers with this. And to talk about this a little bit more and give a little bit more of a flavor of what's happening in that C level, at that C level, but also in, particularly in terms of the composition of the board, we're very happy to have Mohamed Ali, the CEO of the International Data Group, talk to us here through uh, a, a short video. Three years ago, IDC predicted we would see a significant increase in the number of CEOs with technology experience. Recently, I took over the role of CEO of International Data Group, and a big part of the selection process focused on my technology background. Having worked for organizations like IBM, HP, and most recently as CEO of Carbonite. Interestingly, I also serve on the board of iRobot here in the United States. And it is becoming increasingly clear to me that the composition of the board is evolving. Historically, board members were selected primarily based on financial acumen and or industry experience. Moving forward, apart from the increased focus on diversity, there is now a clear demand to augment these capabilities with digital business excellence to help deliver net new revenue streams and organizational structures to execute on digital. This will help to provide a challenging but effective way of accelerating success in an increasingly digital world. Hence, IDC predicts that by 2022, 25% of Europe's top 500 companies will have at least two board members with digital business excellence capabilities.
Thank you very much, Mohamed. Um, so Mohamed talked about digital excellence coming into, into the board. Do we have any examples in Europe? It's an interesting trend, Tom. Um, we have got one standout example. Uh, so Jim Hagemansnabe, who used to run one of the largest European tech organizations, he's now chairman of the board at Siemens here in Munich, but also chairman of the board at Maersk in Denmark. Um, and we're slowly starting to see that uh, those examples coming to the fore. We also see CEOs, as we predicted some years ago, bringing on that technology uh, expertise and experience. So a good example of that is with uh, Lars Jorgensen, the CEO of Novo Nordisk, coming on board in the last 18 months at uh, uh, Novo Nordisk. And he's, he was previously the CIO. So he's got that tech expertise coming into that senior management level uh, type across all organizations. So that's great. So we've got some examples here in Europe as well. So that's a trend that we're seeing. So digital skills are being added to financial acumen as well as industry expertise. What else is missing there? So the other thing that is missing and what, what we're increasingly seeing is this focus on sustainable business expertise. It's clear that the role of the organization is changing in the context of society. Um, and a really good example of a, of a person who's standing out in terms of his voice uh, for this is Paul Polman who's the ex-CEO of Unilever, who is talking about the need to redefine capitalism um, and the role of the organization in society as companies in general need to think about their longer-term impact on society. So that really means that we need to redefine value at some level. Exactly, Tom, and that's a good step into the first pillar of the digital impact framework, focusing on, on value. And there are three levels here. So if you look at this, at the bottom level, uh, we, have, we have to deliver the, outcome, the financial outcome. So top and bottom line growth and earnings per share for shareholders. Beyond that, though, there is this need to work with the ecosystem, so to co-create, to compete, but also this notion of competition coming into play as part of delivering ecosystem value. But at the top level, and this links back to that notion of sustainable business, there is a need to bring in environmental and social impact to create a sense of purpose for employees, but also customers, partners, suppliers, investors, so that they understand how that business value is being delivered across all those different stakeholders. And other examples, because clearly people will be looking for, organizations will be looking for examples to mirror. Yeah, so the one that stands out at the moment, Tom, is Adidas. Um, really good example from Adidas. At the financial level, they've seen 35% growth in their digital business, which is also translated into a tripling of the share price in the last three years. At the ecosystem level, they have the strong commitment to open source, so working with partners. They're one of the leading lights in terms of DevOps in the region. Um, and what they've done recently as an example of this is to invite the BMW Agile team to their innovation hub in Zaragoza in Spain. Um, and there you see that cross-pollination of skills and capabilities across the ecosystem. In terms of the purpose, they've got this big focus on the circular economy um, and reusing ocean plastic, and they expect to create 11 million new shoes this year using recycled ocean plastic. So you can see that value being created at all three of those levels. Okay, thank you for that. So we've talked about the value part of it so far. Now, in order to deliver on those three levels of value, what kind of strategy do organizations need to look for in order to implement that? So the strategy needs to happen at scale. So it's not just about scale at, uh, at a financial level and getting the team on board, but it's strategy across all those three levels, ecosystem and then also into, into building up to purpose. And a really good example of this is PostNL. So PostNL, they are the postal delivery service in the Netherlands, also Belgium, by the way. So very traditional market. Um, challenging market because mail volumes are declining mm -hmm. dramatically, but parcel volumes are going up significantly um, because of e-commerce. But that's competitive. You know, you can't. It's difficult to grab market share in that environment. So, what they're doing is redefining their whole business model and putting technology at the heart of that, focusing on the customer transformation of the networks to deliver scale. But at the top end. They've got this focus on social commitment uh, and sustainability so that when you look at their 
strategic roadmap moving forward, some of the key strategic initiatives that stand out are things like zero emission delivery of parcels, um, social uh, credit ratings, so the credit ratings by, by the social side, diversity, these types of strategic objectives that are not just about operational or financial elements, but they're much more building into that purpose uh, uh, side of, of redefining value. Now, what is clear is that technology is increasingly everywhere in this organization. Um, and as an example, they've created uh, an API uh, platform where they've exposed 15 APIs to the ecosystem. And it means, Tom, that uh, as an example, if you want to, uh, you, if you create an e-scooter startup in the Netherlands and you want to get access to um, the postal code geographic locations for potential customers, you can get access to that data from PostNL. Obviously, they have it, and you can in incorporate it into your mobile app. But you pay PostNL for the use of that data th and, and leveraging that API framework, and so they're creating net new revenue streams leveraging this type of technology and, and ca catering for that decline in the volume of, of mail on, on that side of the business. So that's a really interesting example. So there are two things I take away there. So one is the, the focus on ecosystems and additional ones could be around getting your dry cleaning delivered to your door or personalized health healthcare. Which is where they're, they're moving into those spaces, into okay. healthcare, into logistics outside of mail and parcel, absolutely. So an ever-expanding ecosystem that they're building. Now the other thing you said was technology. So technology is taking a very important role here. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a very good lead into the next uh, data point for the PIN code, <laughs> 95%. So if you look at the proportion of European organizations that are either sustaining or increasing tech spend, 95%, uh, that's what we're looking at here. And that's not just in Western Europe, but it's all the way across into Eastern Europe, across the board. And when you look at the proportion of organizations that are actually increasing their tech spend by more than 10%. It's a significant number, moving between 15 and 20%, depending on, on the country that we look at, across the close to 3,000 executives that we poll as part of our tech uh, industry pulse survey. So the, the, you see this tech spend going up. It's reflected in our forecast for next year. So we're expecting that, 800, that the tech spend will hit 868 billion in 2020, growing at a rate of, of 6%. So you're starting to see an interesting dynamic whereby, despite those macroeconomic challenges that we talked about earlier, tech spend seems to be moving in, in a pretty positive direction. And, but, but there is a dynamic which we need to look at within this. So if you overlay digital transformation spend over tech spend, so overall IT spend, and um, what you see is that digital transformation spend, so this is to spend on the, the innovation technologies, so cloud, mobile, big data, social, but also the innovation accelerators and the associated services around this. Um, that we are seeing the spend move from 31% in, in 2018 to more than, so 51% to 2023. So there is this uh, high proportion of digital transformation spend that's going, that's driving a lot of that growth in terms of that 868 billion that I highlighted earlier. So that's a really interesting data point there as well. Now, a lot of money being spent on digital, but is it having the impact that companies really want to achieve? So for that, uh, we will switch to a video now, a second prediction, uh, prediction from Daniel Hernandez, co-lead of our digital uh, transformation practice. Over the next decade, technology will have a strong impact on the health of the European economy. We start a new decade in 2020 with organizations in the region spending $271 billion. But only 16% of those companies will generate net new revenue streams associated with those digital investments. Now, moving forward, European organizations will require a lot more financial discipline due to the economic slowdown, which is happening in a context of negative interest rates. That means that for a long time, we have been borrowing money from the future to fuel economic growth in the present, and not even that seems to help anymore. But digital technologies have the potential to multiply the value we produce with automation, intelligence, and connectivity so that we pay our debt with the future while maintaining 
and even enhancing our living standard today. Now, this is only possible if European organizations create an integrated roadmap that aligns their digital investments and, up, and provides an overview of the expected business outcomes from digital transformation in the short, mid and long term as we move towards the end of the decade, where we predict that 75% of the European organizations will be fully digitally transformed. Thank you very much, uh, Danielle. So 75% of organizations are going to make it, 25% of organizations might struggle. But what's the key number here to remember? So I think the key number outside of those two, which are critical, but the key yeah. number to remember, which is actually the third number for the PIN code, we've talked about 1.4%, we've talked about 95%, but the third number is that 16%. Th those are the money makers, the digital money makers that we really want to focus on, work out what they're doing, what are they doing right, because they are the ones that are translating those investments into technology into real outcomes. Um, and that's the, the, the key characteristic towards moving towards this future enterprise. So what we're seeing is that IT spending and particularly spending on digital is going up quite significantly. There are pressures on the macroeconomic side and what we're seeing is a disaggregation of those two spending trends now. So can you give us a little bit more context around that? Well, because the, it's, it's the first time, Tom, that we're starting to see that disconnect. Um, so historically, there's always been this correlation between GDP and IT spend. Now, that, that, that seems to be changing at the moment. And our view is that the, the reason for that is the business model transformation that is represented uh, by the shift to the future enterprise has to have tech technology there. So the technology investments have to expand quite significantly in, in order for organizations to survive in the digital economy. Now, we, what we think that needs to happen, though, is a change in the business model. So we're moving from strategy, where we define what needs to be done, to execution here in terms of that business model. And uh, what I'd like you to think about in this context is that startup in, in a garage which goes from virtually nothing to market leader in less than two years. It can happen, Tom. We have seen it in a Absolutely. number of situations. Now, how does that happen? How, how, do they, how do they do that? Well, they create value in different ways. So we move away from linear business processes, but it, into, into more of a, a loop around value where customers uh, or become advocates, they attract new customers, and then those new customers and those customers become co-creators of uh, and prosumers of new products and services, so effectively becoming suppliers, and then providing those products and services back into this, this value loop. And therefore, you get this multiplier effect, the network effect of this ecosystem. But it's underpinned by technology. So intelligence, automation, connectivity provides that exponential growth that comes from leveraging this network and ecosystem in this type of fashion. And there are three pillars here that uh, you point out on this slide. Yeah, so three key things that organizations need to do to move to this type of business model. First of all, become more data-driven. Um, the data, data is a seamless flow of real-time data, where possible, across this uh, value chain, which will determine success. Platform-enabled, it has to be part of a, a platform-based uh, business model. And it's ecosystem-centric, where you're looking outside in, as opposed to just the four walls of your organization. Okay, so what's required to make this happen, then? Well, let's focus a bit on the data, Tom. Um, and I think that uh, let's, the, the, I'm going to start with a view on uh, data growth, which is um, not necessarily new. Uh, so our view is that uh, enterprise data will grow in Europe uh, by 27% in 2020. Um, hitting 3.7 million petabytes. So it's a huge amount of data, but that's, we've talked about that for a long time. What's changed is how we value data. How, how do we actually think about the valuation of that data? So I'm going to run a short exercise here, Tom, just to get you thinking along those lines. So if I was to take away access of all of your mobile devices, your beloved Kindle, which I know you really appreciate, but every single mobile device um, for a month, how much would you pay to get it back? 
I'd probably pay you 100 euros. Only? Yeah, maybe a little bit more. Maybe a little bit more. When I think about it. Think about it. Maybe 1,000, mm. maybe more. I would probably pay 5,000 5, to get access to it. Um, wow, it's, that's deep. It's huh? a lot. Anyway, but everyone values data in slightly different ways because it's not just the, the, the devices that you're trying to get access to. It's all the data that you have on those devices, you, the way you navigate, the, way, the music that you have, all of this data that's there. And I think that's the, the change in the thinking around data that consumers, but increasingly businesses, are, are starting to go through. And it's reflected in terms of the, the number of acquisitions or the, the scale of acquisitions that have gone out uh, in 2019. So we see three big acquisitions, but more across the board, hitting more than $26 billion, focusing on data visualization, analytics, um, and it reflects the, the amount that organizations are willing to, to invest in technology that manages, visualizes, but also analyzes that data as they look to move into monetizing data, which is the longer term. So we know this is part of a journey whereby you start with consolidation, you then you start to visualize, you do the analytics, but data monetization is the end goal. That is where all organizations are really trying to head towards. So that's the Nirvana. So let's have a look at uh, what Francisco Almeida is telling us in the next prediction. The path from big data toward valuable data sets and companies are starting to ramp up their efforts. Connected devices provide a first tier level of interaction with end users. Making sense of the data from these human machine interactions empowers organizations with a wealth of data, stronger IoT deployments, a larger 5G footprint along with a ramp up in investments in edge computing and data management solutions are paving the way for true business value. In fact, according to our latest Pulse survey, 27% of European IoT adopters are already monetizing data. They are adapting their offering by adding new features to traditional products. They are finding new ways of selling those traditional products like an as a service model. And they're discovering new addressable markets or industries they weren't present before. Our forecast for the IT spending of top 500 European companies on advanced technologies in 2022 is expected to total $60.1 billion. And our research also shows that companies focused on big data and analytics initiatives expect a short-term revenue from investment spend to range between 5 and 24% in 2020. Hence, IDC predicts that by 2022, data collected from connected devices will generate net new revenue opportunities of $10.5 billion for top 500 European CEOs. Thank you very much, Francisco. Now, 10.5 billion, it's a reasonably big sized number. Will it make it to the pin code? Not quite, Tom. I think um, it's the tip of the iceberg. It shows where organizations need to head towards, but it's not quite in the pin code, just off the five. Uh, we'll get to the next two a bit later. Do we have some examples there? Because that's clearly a very interesting market segment. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is, it comes back to how data underpins that business model. A really good example is Vitality, uh, which is focusing on creating this shared value insurance. Um, and they operate on the premise that the healthier you are, um, the less you will likely you're going to claim uh, in terms of insurance, and therefore the cheaper you're going to be to insure. Um, so they want to move from becoming a bureaucratic, uh, your bu typical bureaucratic insurer to someone who helps make you healthier and, and, and uh, is part of your day-to-day -day lifestyle. Sounds very interesting. Uh, yeah, we, I'm not sure if you've signed up for it yet, Tom. <laughs> you have to hear the details. So basically the idea is that they, they issue you, the, the members, with a smart watch. <laughs> And then you, they track your exercise, or you track your own exercise, and you upload that data onto their platform. And then they analyze that data in terms of behavioral, clinical, and financial, and, and actuarial data. Um, but they provide rewards to the individuals, their customers, that are performing the best. Um, and then they use that to try and get them to, to keep a very strong exercise regime. Things like free flights, free uh, hotel weekends away. So they partner with hotels and, and airlines in order to deliver that. So it's really that platform-based model, leveraging ecosystem to deliver, to deliver net new revenue streams. And you can really see the results from a financial standpoint as well. So that's, that's great. So that's one example. Do we see it elsewhere? Yeah, well, the, the thing is, Tom, is that this is happening in every industry. And uh, our view is that this notion of real-time data flowing through this ecosystem is, 
every industry is going to be affected, whether it be retail, utilities, the as-a-service economy, the passenger economy, open banking. It's all moving in this direction. And if you're an organization that thinks that this is not going to happen in my industry, then you're likely to hit that 25 percent that doesn't make it over the longer term. Now, at the core, the one thing that I would highlight here, Tom, is that the core of this is intelligence. So, and this is why, because in order to, to deal with the data that we talked about, you need a very strong intelligent core, uh, not only from a technology standpoint, but from a business standpoint as well. And this is why we think AI is, is really going to drive business models moving forward. And we think that 2020 is going to be the year for AI in Europe. Um, we expect AI to grow at 35% moving into 2020, hitting $10 billion. So that is the fourth number in the PIN code is 35% because that's such a high growth market and we think that AI is really one to watch moving forward. So we've got that focus on intelligence, but it's underpinned by technology now. That clearly means that we need to focus on the technology architecture going forward. And what's going to happen there from our perspective? So we've talked about value, the new definition of value, the strategy to support that, the move to the business model, uh, which reflects that strategy. But our view is that the business model of the future requires uh, a different technology foundation, one whereby enterprise IT is aggressively modernized to this intelligent core. And that intelligent core, which is AI-driven, as we talked about earlier, is increasingly fed by data pipelines coming not only from internal processes and sources, but increasingly external uh, sources. And the, the nature and uh, connectivity around those sources is actually changing quite dramatically. So, for example, Edge, uh, we see that redefining infrastructure in general because uh, of, by 2023, the, there's going to be 35% uh, deployments of inf infrastructure at the edge uh, as, a as a proportion of total infrastructure investment. So 35% going to the edge in terms of net new investments. And 5G is also going to drive connectivity to a next level. And we predict that two-thirds of telcos in Europe will roll out 5G services uh, moving into next year. So we said so that's going to provide an extra level of latency for organizations looking to create those data pipelines coming in and out of that intelligent core. Now, we do think that this architecture, this foundation, is going to break down those, the, the differences or the, the lines between IT, business, and digital once and for all. And it's going to be the most important business decision that the organization is going to make over the next 10 years, because this will fundamentally underpin everything that the organization does. So, so there's a lot of work to do, but that also means that that's a, that's a big mountain to climb. What's the focus in the short term? The focus is the core. So it's all about core modernization at the moment. For the first time ever, we're hearing about ERP in the context of digital transformation because it's clear that those wonderful new innovations coming around the edge won't scale unless they're connected to the core. Um, and, and, and all the associated elements from application all the way through to infrastructure. Now, the key thing in, that's really affecting Europe moving into 2020 is the announcement by SAP that they are going to terminate support for their customers that are not on S4 HANA by 2025. And that's creating a, a, a sense of urgency around redefining the core uh, as part of the application stack, but that, hits, that affects all parts of the broader enterprise IT environment. But I guess one of the key questions there would be, what's the role of cloud in this then? So cloud plays a significant role because core modernization is increasingly moving to the cloud. So we see two paths to the cloud. Uh, one is digital innovation, so the net new cloud native apps that are, sprung, that are being built up as, in terms of container environments primarily. But then the core modernization piece is happening in parallel. Those are the harder to move workloads, mission critical workloads. Um, historically sat on premise, we're moving towards this more hybrid multi-cloud environment where those, the, the core is moving to the cloud. So that's very interesting. And someone who's doing that, in fact, we'll hear from next. And that's Rasmus Halt from uh, Maersk, who's talking to uh, Karl Arndt, uh, the head of our cloud practice. What is the role of cloud in your core modernization journey? So cloud is central to what we're trying to achieve in our core modernization. And we actually see it as part of 
leaving the classic on-premise IT. The main reason for modernizing the core is to support our digital future. So the digital overlay over our standard of processes and offering our customers new compelling services. We see the benefits being multiple, but the most accelerating factor is the ability to innovate on top of our classic business and building new uh, service offerings for our customers. But one of the added benefit would definitely be uh, back office automation or optimization via automation. Very much Carla and Rasmus. And so off the back of that, our prediction is that by 2025, 60% of European organizations will modernize their core IT, leveraging the, the cloud, resulting in a 25% business productivity improvement. So we are moving to this hybrid multi-cloud world, uh, and increasingly we're seeing the hyperscaler cloud platforms, uh, th th those platform providers starting uh, to dominate. Mm. So, so we talked uh, quite a bit of the, about this last year as well, So, but what's new now? Well, there's a lot new, Tom, <laughs> and actually what, I, what we've done here is provide an overview of some, not all, of, of uh, the, the big events that have uh, hit the market in 2019, which involved the hyperscalers. Um, and so new deals, new partnerships and ecosystem expansion, that they are really redefining the role of vendors, partners, customers as part of this, this tech ecosystem. And it's not exhaustive. We haven't got all of these the events there, but there's billions of dollars being spent in this environment as they start to dominate a lot of spend, but also new, the new ecosystems around those spend, uh, that, that spend as customers really start to look for, to ways to partner with them. Now, when you ask about what's new, the other element is there is a focus on the core. So we talked about core modernization and the hyperscalers are going after the core. And we see two sides of a coin here. On the one hand, when you look at the mission critical workloads, those, those, those core workloads, Microsoft really stands out with Azure as, as the, and SA, we, we look at SAP as an example, Microsoft Azure is the, is, seems to be the leading platform based on our survey. But when you look at the overall cloud market share, AWS stands out. So uh, we're coming at it from different angles. Uh, Google is really pushing hard at this and growing fast as well in parallel, IBM in the frame. And so the, the, we, we see all of these players really going after this next phase of growth. It's a high growth market. There's a lot uh, to, to be had uh, in the next five years. But we do think that a lot of it will rest on their ability to get into that core because it'll drive consumption. It'll drive stickiness with customers, which is going to be critical over the long term and define who's going to win and lose in this, this really interesting next phase of the hyperscaler cloud platform revolution. So that's very interesting, but who's, who's going to organize that? Because somebody needs to orchestrate how this all comes together as you're looking at the platform architecture. It's a very um, good question, Tom. And uh, there are four threads uh, that are putting up their hands. So we see heads of innovation, CIOs, uh, CDOs, CTOs, all putting up their hands to try and help orchestrate this. The, the clear feedback from CIOs, and this is from our CIO summit earlier this year, is that 73% of CIOs want to be that orchestrator of budgets, uh, technologies, and the stakeholders uh, that are going to be surrounding this digital transformation. So that's we, we, we really think that the CIO should be that orchestrator of the broader digital transformation. And in fact, hopefully, we've got someone who will agree with you. So we are going to hear from Michael Hilzinger, who was at our CIO summit this year, and he is the managing director as well as CIO at Knorr Bremse. So let's roll the video. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to the CIO Summit in Dublin. That was really a great event, very valuable for me. In my previous job, I was really a digital transformation agent for the company. With uh, Gisbert Rühl, together we try to digitally transform Klöckner, and not only Klöckner, but the entire steel industry. And this was part of the reason why I was hired for my current job as a CIO of Knorr Bremsen. 
currently I'm working on the IT strategy for Knorr Bremse, and this is a big transformation job that we have to do here. IT needs to become a part of the business organization. There are so many products and services that rely on IT, and my job and that of my management team and, the, and everybody in the IT organization will be to bring IT close to the business and part of the services and products of the uh, Knorr Bremse organization. The CIO clearly is a digital transformation agent, has the role of an orchestrator to bring business and IT, the various disciplines of the business and IT together and get the requirements from the business organization, work with the budgets that are available and bring technology that is available in the market to the company. Thank you very much, Michael. Really interesting perspectives there, and it lines up exactly with our prediction that by 2022, 30% of European organizations will define a new technology leadership role combining CIO, CTO, CDO, and innovation functions. So we're starting to see a convergence of roles there, Tom. And um, one of the things that we, we do expect as part of that is that that role is likely to report into the CEO, um, and it should do, I think, from our perspective. Now, and they, but one thing that I would highlight is that there needs to be a use case obsession for that technology leadership role. So focusing on the business initiative supported by technology that is measurable, therefore you're def de delivering those outcomes as part of our digital impact framework. Now, when we went out and we asked CIOs, uh, was the organizations in general, what they, what they were being measured on, see the number one thing that stands out there is, is business alignment. Um, and that lines up with what my, exactly what Michael was saying in terms of being aligned with the business. But number two is cost. They still need to focus on cost management as well. Mm -hmm. So, but is this for IT only, or do we actually see this now spreading across the organization? So it's a big shift now, Tom. Historically, it was okay, well, you've got to manage costs in IT only, mm -hmm. but now there's this expectation that we use technology to reduce costs outside uh, of IT and into the business. And that's happening very much at the process level. Um, and increasingly, robotic process automation is being used in that respect. But that quickly is being commoditized. Um, and we, we see a need to infuse intelligence into the, those process automation initiatives to the extent that our sixth prediction is that by 2023, 70% of European intelligent process automation initiatives will be infused with AI. Um, so we really see these, the, the need for these uh, processes to become more intelligent in line with that business model of the future where intelligence is at the core and the processes define how people work, so therefore they need to be infused with intelligence to support decision making. So the theme of intelligence continues throughout this particular area as well, but it's not the full story. It's not the full story. It's, it has to be connected, Tom. And I think this is a really good example from Saab, um, the defense and security uh, element of Saab. And what you see here is how they are looking to connect their forecast to deliver manufacturing process with the buy to evaluate uh, customer engagement process. And what they're looking to do is to arm their field service technicians with data from uh, it, focusing on inventory optimization, spare parts availability, product quality that they can use as part of their customer interactions. Um, because the more they know about the products that are available in, in, in inventory and in the ERP systems, the better armed they are to have the right conversations with customers and potentially even drive new revenue streams for the broader organization. So this is a servitization business model, effectively, that's, that's based on real-time data, but very much focused on powerful customer experience. So this is exactly the example. So bringing back office processes with front office processes and using customer experience to really drive the back office. And, but as part of that, what we see is this convergence between EX and CX. Last year, we talked about CX being the new competitive differentiator, the enterprise competitive differentiator. But now we see the convergence of, of employee experience with customer experience um, and the emergence of what we call KBIs. And because we love acronyms so, so much, can you tell us a little bit more about KBIs? Yeah, so KBIs are key behavioral indicators. Um, and it's a move on from KPIs. And the idea here, with the likes of return on experience, experience level agreements, net, employee net promoter score, customer effort scores, 
um, that, that we are looking to get feedback from key stakeholders in uh, uh, the process of delivering those customer experiences. Um, because what you need is the ability to create an engaged, empowered, and hopefully inspired workforce so that you can create those customer experiences. Because as uh, Richard Branson says, Virgin, the, the founder of Virgin, clients don't come first, employees come first. If you take care of the employees, they will uh, take care of those, of those clients. So it leads into our prediction that by 2022, 60% of the top 2,000 European organizations will replace KB, KPIs with KBIs, those wonderful new acronyms, to accelerate employee and customer advocacy. So that's really interesting. Now, what happens so that when we look at the elements of the framework, um, so we've looked at uh, the technology part, now we're looking at, um, we've, uh, we've looked at the tech part, now we're connecting that really very much to people because people really need to drive that. So that is powered by people. And what we've seen in the past is that when we talked last year and we introduced the notion of the dream team at that point is that they're absolutely key. They need to mesh together incredibly well, but now they really need to scale whatever they do throughout the organization. So how, how, does, how does that work? Well, we have a big problem on, on that front, Tom. We have a, uh, the, this mounting skills gap. We talked about that in terms of the review of last year's predictions. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we can't fill these roles. There's 550,000 jobs, digital skills jobs that won't be filled in 2020, translating into a $180 billion potential revenue uh, impact, so revenue loss impact, a double what we had previously in place. Um, and that, by the way, is the fifth number for the PIN code. Right. So I hope you remember the other four, Tom. <laughs> we'll go back to them at the end. But that, so that $180 billion is, that, uh, is that the, the representation of that skills gap. Now, what, what is clear is that organizations are trying to work out how do I recruit where do I recruit from? But most importantly, how, do I, how much do they, I pay these people um, if I can get access to them? And if, because it's so hard to get access because of this talent war, you might need to rethink how you retain skills right. as well. And I think culture is going to be quite an important part of retaining the right skills in your organization. And that leads us very nicely into the next prediction. And in fact, uh, culture is elementary. And we are going to hear from Nick Whitaker from Virgin Atlantic, as well as Jen Thompson, who leads our DevOps practice. Please roll the video. So recent IDC research shows that 40% of European organizations identify culture as the weakest link in accelerating enterprise agility. And a good example of an organization that it's on this journey to transformation is Virgin Atlantic. And I'm happy to have Nick Whitaker, uh, head of engineering and DevOps here with us today. So Nick, can you tell us a bit about what Virgin has been doing to accelerate cultural change? Sure. Well, of course, at Virgin Atlantic, we have the advantage of already owning a very strong internal culture that supports a lot of the values you need to exhibit during a transformation. But of course, the beginning of our journey, which started a couple of years ago, was very much a, a grassroots effort led from within technology and driven from technology. Uh, um, one of the techniques we've brought to bear there is creating a product owner community across the teams involved, where we've very much put those product owners on the hook to ensure that the teams were focused on outcome and value rather than simply functional requirements. And over time, we found that organically, those teams were beginning to align their backlogs to seek the best common opportunity for the best organizational outcome um, from their requirements backlog rather than what was best, best for those projects. Uh, cut to today, we're now in the middle of a root and branch uh, transformation. Indeed, uh, the division I work in is no longer just called technology, it's technology transformation. We've now moved uh, the PMO and the technology functions together. So what we expect to see um, over the next few months and years is a joining of that top-down organizational-led approach that will meet in the middle uh, with the grassroots technology-driven uh, approach um, and, and hopefully we should see the, the fruits of that, that combined effort over time. Absolutely. And this is a fantastic example of cultural change being organisational-wide. 
it's great to see that the dev ops and engineering teams are starting to become some of the cultural change agents within organizations. So, of course, when addressing cultural change, um, it's really important that organizations, um, they don't try to replicate or copycat a unicorn culture. Those that are doing this um, will really struggle to produce value and returns. So it's really important to really think about um, creating your unique corporate culture. And we can only underline this uh, or continue to underline this because IDC is predicting that, that by 2022, a third of European organizations will fail to deliver business agility and innovation due to a copycat culture. Thank you. Nick, thank you, Jen. That's great. So build your own. Make sure that you build your own flavor of, of culture and organization. Now, they're talking also a little bit about the industrialization aspect, but I think it's also fair to say that there's increasing scrutiny on some of the innovation activities that are happening. So can you take us maybe through the next example here? Yeah, so that's a good example with Aviva's Digital Garage. The new CEO coming on board um, and basically saying, Let's, let's take a look at this hub, which was designed to attract these new skills, user experience experts, data scientists, the agile architects. Um, and the new CEO has come on board and say, okay, let's really look at uh, whether these initiatives are delivering the outcomes. And it's off the back of that that we really believe that the innovation lab needs to become uh, an innovation factory, so industrialize innovation. And that innovation factory becomes the catalyst for cultural change because that, that, that anchor point is absolutely required. Now, we're aware that uh, there's this app explosion that's happening. So our prediction is that over the next five years, there'll be 500 million new apps that are created, which is the same as we've created over the last 40 so this exponential uh, growth in apps that we're creating, developer explosion off the back of that. But the problem with the, de the, the developer expansion in these type of innovation hubs is that they tend to be separated from the business. And what we see as a, as a solution to that is that they need to be embedded back into the business. So we saw this at JJ Foods, where they're putting the developer teams into the sales teams to understand the business requirements and then develop the capabilities, the digital capabilities that reflect those market requirements. So in order for that top-down, bottoms-up approach that Nick talked about to actually work, the key thing here is that that innovation factory sits in the business, understands the business, and helps to drive the business. Okay, so so that's that's very interesting. So for the digital dream team, that gives us give, gives them uh, um, an anchor to to talk about and and look at speed and and uh, agility to a degree, and also scale. But they can really only scale that if it's secure, inherently secure. So how are we doing there? Well, not so well, Tom. That's the problem. In, in the market, when you look at the security market uh, over the course of time, we've tended to go after dealing with vulnerabilities and issues on a very point solution type of approach. So going after endpoint security, messaging security, network security, as we can see in, in this chart. And that's high growth markets or relatively high growth markets hitting about 9 billion in 2020 for in terms of scale. But it doesn't really solve the problem of trying to uh, prevent this boat from sinking because we're still trying to patch everything uh, in, in, a, in a very ad hoc type of manner. What we see being more successful moving forward is a shift towards integrating these points point solutions um, uh, for, and, and, and at a customer level so that you can create the security platform which provides a basis for this operational excellence, the starting point to this roadmap to security value. Use that to create uh, business impact by mitigating and managing risk. But beyond that, the digital trust, which is going to be critical for digital transformation, so the shift towards the future enterprise. Mm -hmm. That also changes the role of the CISO going forward. And in fact, to talk about that, uh, very happy to have Nick Smith from Next15 talking to Dominic Trott, our security lead. So Nick, hi. Uh, thanks for coming along to our annual European CISO Summit. Uh, I want to talk to you a bit about one of the themes we explored earlier at this event, uh, something that's really topical for uh, CISOs really interested to, to, to talk about um, their, their future in the role. How do you think that's going to evolve going forwards? 
I think that you know, the role of the CISO is, is, is undervalued because we are a leader in what we do. We're, a, we're an SME, we're a subject matter expert. But some companies, especially some of the, indus the industries and companies I've worked for, that security really isn't embedded into the core strategy of the business. And I think that's where it's, that role is misunderstood or misinterpreted in a way. That's really interesting. That chimes really well with um, one of the predictions we're building for our annual European um, Futurescape uh, report. Uh, the security element with that, our prediction, is that by 2022, uh, the, the, the CISO uh, will face a cut-off point. Either they will or they will not have been able to step up to the role of being the business security leader. The opportunity is there for them to do so, but our research indicates that something like three quarters of CISOs, either they feel that they don't personally have the skills and capabilities to make that leap to become a business leader, or they don't even realise that there is a challenge and a need to do so. How, how would you react to that? It is accurate in a way. I think, you know, as a sitting in a CISO position previously, I'd like to think that, you know, we can elevate that role and make it more, make the uh, leadership teams more aware of what we do. So I think you know you ingest that role into the core of your business, into your into your strategy, because that's essentially where security needs to sit. But I do think that it's an educational journey that we need to take CEOs, CFOs on to make sure that they're aware not the technical elements of what that role delivers, but certainly from a risk and compliance standpoint. Great. Well. Real pleasure to hear from you. Thank you for, for taking us through your thoughts and expectations there. Good luck taking your board on that journey. Thank so you very much. Thank you again for your time. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nick and Dom, talking at the uh, IDC CISO Summit this year. Um, so this gives you an impression, as you can see here as well, about the additional elements that we feel that the CISO needs to bring to the table, and Dominic and uh, Nick just talked about that as well. So this is, again, another role at the sea level that needs to extend into communications, financial acumen, and a lot of other roles that are necessary. Now, in order to build digital trust, however, what we believe is that you need to bring more to the table. It's not just security and risk. It is also about ethics that we feel, particularly here in Europe. And we often talk about it in terms of data in particular and AI. So what I would like to do is move into the next video straight away from uh, Neil and Jack. Uh, Neil, the lead of our AI and IPA practice and Jack supporting on the AI practice. So why don't we go to the next prediction, please? Today, digital products and services reach deeply into citizens' lives, as well as into business operations. The ethical use of digital technology is naturally becoming a concern for governments and societies across Europe. AI systems in particular can give rise to all kinds of unintended and unwelcome outcomes. Consequently, the debate around AI and ethics has grown with the rapid rise of the technology. The incoming Director General of the European Commission wants to create new legislation to ensure ethical use of AI systems. And this is just one way in which public interest in AI ethics is being surfaced. Technology vendors are becoming more alive to this issue and enterprises are waking up to new potential obligations. Today in Europe, only 18% of organizations have established a senior management position with responsibility for AI ethics, but we expect this situation to change quickly. IDC predicts that by 2024, 50% of all European company CEOs will report annually on the ethical use of automation, data and AI within their organisation. Thank you very much, uh, Neil and Jack. Um, a strong focus on regulation here. Yeah, um, but as we know, Tom, regulation doesn't always keep up with the pace of innovation. So we think that cu uh, customers really need to get ahead of this. A good example of is, is ING, uh, putting in place this Data Ethics Council. Um, and it comes back to what we talked about in terms of the redefinition of business value, because our view is that trust really needs to be embedded into every element of this redefinition of, of business value. And what's really interesting is that if you're able to do that and leverage this new business model of the future, which is based on this value loop, and you embed trust uh, into every element of that network, then you start to leverage the multiplier effect of that ecosystem 
And it starts to create potentially something very special, which I think all organizations out there need to think about because our last, uh, our latest CEO survey shows that digital trust is the number one priority for their focus areas moving forward into the, towards the future enterprise of the next five years, Tom. So thank you for that. So a recipe for success that we've uh, delivered, uh, hopefully uh, in a very quick format over the last hour. Here is a summary of our predictions for you to, uh, to look at again. Now, um, I think what would be helpful, Phil, if you just left with just a couple of words of advice. So we've taken everyone through the digital impact framework. So what do people need to remember? Well, the, the PIN code, uh, that's critical, those five numbers, 1.4%, 95%, 16, 35, and 180 billion. Hopefully everyone takes that away. No, but in terms of value, in these uncertain times, do well and do good. Tech everywhere for the strategy, that's strategy at scale. Exponential thinking for the money makers, those new digital money, money makers. Use case obsession at the tech level. Go, go business focus, but leverage intelligence, automation, connectivity, and create that DIY culture. Not the unicorn culture, the DIY culture, mm -hmm. but mind the skills gap. That's gonna be critical. All right, super. That is it in very uh, quick, quick words. Thank you very much for that, Phil. So if you have more interest and appetite to hear more from IDC, there are some upcoming Futurescapes that you can listen to and join. You can also read the document uh, and download it straight after this event. So that's available to you now. It's a spin on the worldwide predictions and the impact on and the European perspective. And it just remains for me to say, Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Phil. Thank you to the analyst team. Is there going to be no Christmas carol at the end, Tom? I think looking at the time up there, it says we are just out of time. Regrettably, I'm uh, sure everyone would save, have enjoyed it. Saved that. by the bell. But we can wish everyone a happy Christmas Absolutely. and all the best for 2020. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.